this opportunity in your presence. This is the day that you have made. So we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. No matter what the doctor says, no matter what our bank account says, no matter even what our spouse or our neighbor might say, you are God and you are good. I am always thankful for the opportunity to preach your word. So I pray, Father God, that I would get out of the way and that your Holy Spirit would take over. And I pray that every heart would be open to receive what you have for us today. We thank you for this opportunity to worship. I heard a pastor once say, if your worship is not top notch, you're not ready to go to heaven yet. So Father God, I pray that we would continue to be free and we would worship you in freedom and in truth. I tell people all the time, the greatest your struggle, the greater your worship should always be. So Father God, we rebuke the enemy in the name of Jesus. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would reign and let Jesus have victory today. It's in his name we pray. All God's people say, Amen. Before you sit down, turn around and just say hello to somebody. And then we'll get going today. His amazing wife, Dr. Rico. They are, so let me go ahead and say that. Um, and I don't say that just because I'm pastoring or preaching at a church. Believe me, I have spoken to some churches where it was hard for me to honor uh, the man that was preaching the gospel because I knew what he did on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday. But yet I still honor the word. But let me just tell you, I've been with your pastor on multiple occasions, and he is a man on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday that he is in here on Sunday. Him and his wife are amazing. I love them with all my heart, and I actually came out of retirement to preach today. I am on a year-long sabbatical after 28 years of serving the Lord faithfully. I'm going to see my last two boys out of the house. I got one son about to be married, Malachi. Uh, Christian Marcellus Chapman, and my other two are with me, Jeremiah Christian Chapman and Isaiah Christian Chapman. They are seniors in school. I've been married 33 years, almost 34 years, and the Lord asked me to stop shepherding others and shepherd my family for this season. So that's what I am doing. I'm also writing my third book, um, the Revenant, which uh, the Revenant means what is lost has now been found and is now back to life. And I'm writing a book on the book of Acts, how the church needs to get back to who we used to be. And so I'm excited about that. I'm working on a music album. Uh, so if you want to check out any of my music, just go to Alexa and say play Christian Chapman. And uh, hopefully you'll see a little taste of what I'm doing in the studio right now. I'm just doing a lot of fun stuff. But more than anything, I'm just loving on my family. I've got some friends that are here today. I see Tyrone and his family and Angelo and his family and Otis and Rhonda and Mark and Diane and Michael. And I just see this Amy is here. Uh, so we just have a, a lot uh, of opportunity to be together as a family. I'm very comfortable. I used to travel and preach as an itinerant speaker. So for about eight years, 20 days a month, I was on a plane. I was in a car. I was in a hotel. I was in a green room. And then I had some guy telling me, get on the stage, the camera's rolling, five, four, hit the X, and when that clock goes, you're off. Which was always an interesting thing for me, uh, because there's no time limit on the gospel, but yet I was always on a time limit with the gospel. But that's what I did for a long season of my life, and I spoke in every denomination, in every church you can imagine, all over the world. And uh, some, my brother that was uh, here walking around with me today said, Man, I think I've seen you on TV. And I said, oh, I hope it was a good channel. <laughs> and so, uh, but we're having a good time. I'm very comfortable being here with you today. Uh, it's not about white, red, yellow, black. It's about the gospel. And I remember when I spoke at a church, it was a mega church in Atlanta years and years ago. Uh, they had an MC, the first time I ever seen an MC at a conference. And this guy was laying it down. 
And he saw me get on the stage and he just started smiling. He started working that leg. <laughs> and when he introduced me, he said, I want to introduce to you a man I like to call The Rock. I'm like, man, this brother don't even know me. He called me The Rock. He said, don't tell me you don't see him, praise God. He the brightest one on the stage. <laughs> and I got up and preached the gospel. And what I learned in that moment, as the altar was filled and people were getting saved radically, it's not about our flesh. It's about the spirit. It's about the message of Jesus. And so I'm here to preach that message to you today. I'm glad to be alive. Uh, my wife and I and our family caught COVID about uh, a couple of months ago. And I was over it in probably three or four days and back to working out again on day five. And my poor wife, who is a CVICU heart nurse, uh, I thought she was going to die for about 15 days. It was terrifying. And God did something in the moment of that valley that I want to share with you. Boy, I cried. She had 103, 104 temperature for 15 days straight. She got up out of bed and got out of breath, and I had to carry her places to go use the restroom and take showers, and she would lay in the shower with soap in her hair, and she couldn't even get up because she couldn't breathe, and I said, I have to call the ambulance, and it was so discouraging to see a, hear a CVI say, you nurse say, don't take me to the hospital. I won't get better, and I'm like, Phew we got to have that conversation after you get better. because that's, that's scary when a nurse says, don't take me for help. Mm. So I said, we're going to ride this out, me and you and the Lord. And I laid in the floor, and I cried out to God. Yeah. Speak to me. Touch my wife. Nothing is working. Where are you? And my wife laid in the floor, and she cried. And why is God not answering? She's healed, and she's healthy, and she's back at work. But let me tell you what I learned in that moment. When God doesn't show up, when he doesn't show out, and when he don't speak, he's still God. Yeah. And I had to come to the place where if my wife and I lost our life, I know who I am because he is the I am in my life. And so, I don't know what valley you might be in today, but give God the praise in it because if you can't hear him, if you can't see him, and if you can't feel his presence, he is still God. And so it was an interesting journey, and I'm glad to be on the other side of it. I tell you, man, COVID is a, it's the new leprosy. I'd go up to somebody and be talking to him, man, having a great conversation. It's like, He's like, man, how you doing? I said, man, I got over COVID about a month ago. He's like, man, I'll talk to you later, brother. Let's be good talking to you. <laughs> and so it's been one of those things where we've had to kind of get used to uh, kind of sharing our experience with people. And uh, I'm just glad to be here. I love your pastor and his wife. They're just amazing. And I love the gospel. And I want to, for years, I, I felt like I just entertained with the gospel. And I'm not there anymore. And for a long time, I preached. And I, I'm really not there anymore. And I've done so much teaching in my life. I'm not even there anymore. Can I tell you where I am? I really just want to talk to you today. Yeah. I would love the opportunity to not sensationalize anything, yeah. but just share an authentic message about who Jesus is Amen. and about how he transformed my life. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to John chapter 4. I want to read to you a full gospel presentation that I think will challenge you and encourage you at the same time today. It's a beautiful story about a lost woman at a well. And she was encountered by Jesus. And it was an amazing encounter. Now what's interesting about this encounter is the chapter before Jesus had an encounter with the most intelligent legalistic man on the planet. His name was Le uh, uh, Nicodemus. And he left Nicodemus all by himself in the dark. And he traveled to a place to be with a woman that everyone despised. And I think it's worth noting that we can't come to Jesus behind the curtain. He wants us fully out. That's why the curtain in the temple tore. It's time to be real with who we are and let people know who we are. And so we pick this story up in verse 1. Now when Jesus learned, I'm going to read different parts and explain as we go along. Is that okay? Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea 
And he departed again for Galilee. And he had, we need to underline that in our Bibles. If you have your pen with you, you need to underline. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, he was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour when this woman came to approach him. So I want to explain to you what's going on. First of all, Jesus did not have to go through Samaria. The traditional nation of Israel route that all of the Jewish people took, took them around Samaria. They would walk right up to the border of Samaria. Then they would cross the Jordan River. They would go 50 miles out of their way. Man, that's a long walk, folks. 50 miles they would go out of their way and then cross back over the Jordan River and continue their journey to Galilee or Judea. What would cause them to go 50 miles out of their way? Well, the Samaritan people did not believe as they believed. They only believed in the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And they didn't hold to a lot of the Jewish traditions and laws. And they were half Jew and half Gentile. So because they weren't pure blood, the Jewish people hated them. So there were all kinds of reasons the Jewish people didn't go there. None of them valid. It was spun by racism and hate and separation and division and legalism and, re and religious activity. And they would go all the way around Samaria. And so Jesus could have taken that traditional route. But he loves people. And he's not religious. And he's not political. And he's not divisive. He's not about the flesh. He's about the inner part of a man and a woman. And so he goes to a place. So why would scripture say he had to go there? Only because nobody else was willing to. And I'm so thankful to serve a Lord that found me exactly where he found me. Because it wasn't on church on Sunday morning. How many of you would say today, I'm doing some research for my new book, The Revenant. How many of you would say today that you had a radical life transformational experience with Christ outside of church? I want you to look around. I tell people all the time that the gathering on Sunday is amazing. Yeah. Oh, it's so necessary. I'm a big fan of church on Sunday. We cannot dismiss Monday through Saturday. We are missing out on six amazing days to worship God and share the gospel because we're depending on that one and a half hours on Sunday to cure us of cancer, to cure us of our marriage issues, to cure us of our kids that are in rebellion, to cure us of our financial difficulties, to cure us of the people that don't understand us and reject us. We cannot expect Pastor Sam and his lovely wife to help us in an hour and a half cure what we've given to the world six other days a week. It's absolutely impossible. So I love coming together on Sunday. But man, I love Monday. I love me some Tuesday. I actually convinced my old church that playing golf was relational. And it's a great opportunity. So what I used to do when I wouldn't play golf, I would always go by myself. Because what they're going to do, they're going to put you with three other people. Three other people that I don't know have to listen to me for four hours talking about how good God is. <laughs> Grab that wave and come and talk to me about Jesus. Man, why are you even talking about Jesus? Because Paul said he finished the course. Baby, that's 18 <laughs> And I can't tell you how many times I have led people to the Lord on the golf course. Now, they can go with me to church on Sunday, but they got saved on hole number eight in South Carolina. <laughs> we got so many people that are waiting for the Lord to do a great work on Sunday. And, man, we come up and we do our thing. But I tell people all the time, it's great to worship God in the way we worship God. But if you don't worship God like that at Harris Theater, then maybe what you're doing on Sunday ain't real. That's right. <laughs> I am the same all the time. I don't change. And I love it that Jesus was keeping it real all the time. He was authentic in his life, in his travels, in his words. That's what makes his message so trustworthy. That's why people tell me all the time, man, you should give more attention to science. I'm like, man, science changes every year. It changes with the ocean's tide. 
I'm not giving my eternity to science. Now, I'm glad my dad is alive. He's alive because of a stem cell transplant at Duke University. But at some point, that stem cell transplant is going to run out. And my dad's going to be face to face with the God of the universe. And the only thing that's going to matter for my father is the relationship that he has with Jesus Christ. I love it that Jesus goes where nobody else will go. He says what nobody else is willing to say. And he's willing to sit with people and be with people that nobody else will be with. And I love this example. I love it that scripture says he had to pass through Samaria. And you know what? I feel like Jesus still has to do these things because I think people on Sunday, especially the Western church, like if I preach in Africa, man, it's a whole different experience than when I preach on in Wisconsin. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like when, I, when I preach in Guatemala, man, it's a whole different experience when I preach in Las Vegas at a mega church. I mean, when, when I preached... In Mexico, in the Baja Desert, it was, it was a really, at an orphanage, it was a really different experience than when I preached in Cali or when I preached in Seattle. But it's the same power. Yeah, it but we have to be willing to receive it and live it out. Amen. Now, I think Jesus did this as an example to the church. This is how you're called to live. How I found you is how you need to present me to others. They're waiting for you. They're not going to come to church on Sunday, but they'll see you at the grocery store. They'll see you at clean juice. They'll see you at Starbucks. They'll see you at the workplace. They'll see you at the basketball game. They'll see you at the Panther Stadium. And when they see you, they need to know what they're experiencing is real. Yes. Amen. And I love it that Jesus went to a woman at, at the sixth hour of the day. This is the time when nobody gathered water. They always went in the morning or late in the afternoon. She's at the well at the hottest part of the day. And she was traveling alone. When women never traveled alone, they always traveled in groups because they were worried about being robbed. And so why is this woman alone and why is she there at the hottest part of the day? Because she's living in sin and she's rejected by her own people. And Jesus said, that sounds like a great opportunity for transformational change. And we encounter those people all day long. And we invite them to come to church on Sunday when Jesus is saying, we want you to have church right where you are. And it starts with the church. I remember a friend of mine, a young man that radically gave his life to Christ at one of my youth conferences. About five years after he gave his life to Christ, he called me. He said, man, I, I'm a head pastor now in the mountains of North Wilkesboro, and I want you to come preach a revival for me. He said, man, I'm going door to door. We got multicultural, multi-generational worship taking place. He said, God is doing such good things. He said, our land is paid for. It's an old church, but we're changing. I'm doing some great things. Would you come preach revival? I said, yeah, man, I'm, I'm actually off that Monday through Thursday. Thursday. I'll come do it. And so I show up at the church, and the elders meet me in the parking lot, but the pastor wasn't there. And I said, man, where's that young brother at? He said, well, we had to let him go. I said, why'd you have to let him go? He said, well, he was bringing people to church that we didn't want here. And he was being radical and doing outreach events and feeding the homeless, and I couldn't believe this guy was an elder in the church. And I said, well, listen, man, it's been, it's been great hanging out with you. I, I honor you guys doing what you do. And he, they said, no, no, no. We want you to preach. And we want you to say whatever the Lord lays on your heart. I said, you might want to rethink that one, brother. <laughs> I don't think you want me to preach at this church this week. He said, oh, yeah, we do. We say, we want you to say whatever God lays on your heart. I said, are you sure? I gave him every opportunity to get out. But they said, do it. So I went. And I preached as hard as I've ever preached, and I cried more tears than I've ever cried in my life. And I went to the altar and got on my knees, and what I noticed is I was the only one listening to myself preach, and I was the only one crying, and I was the only one down at the altar. That church that is paid for, that has about 20 acres of land in a community that needs the gospel, they got more tombstones outside than they got life on the inside. And they're still the same. Because they've made church about what they want it to be, and they've made it about Sunday when it's really about living outside the box and living church 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I'm so thankful that we have the example of Jesus when everybody else says we're going to walk this way. Jesus says I'm walking this way. And I share this about the church because I think America is full of churches with great potential. 
In fact, one of the reasons I resigned and pulled back and started writing this book called The Revenant to get the church back to the book of Acts again is because I started doing research. Monday through Saturday, I started driving all over the city and looking at churches in every zip code. And what I noticed is that we had beautiful buildings and we had amazing land, but we didn't have any activity Monday through Saturday. But now it's filled on Sunday, but there's no there's no school there on Monday through Friday. They're not feeding the homeless. They don't have they don't have people sleeping there that are in need of, of laying their head in a safe place. I mean, there's no there's no uh, ministry taking place to help people overcome addiction. I mean, nothing. All week long, even my church, no activity. But they got the best land and the best building in the whole town. And God said, "This has got to change." And the Lord convicted me that though everybody else is walking this way, Jesus said, I need you for this season to walk with me. And so I'm walking. And once again, I haven't heard what God wants me to do. He hasn't spoke to me, but he's still God. And I really can't say what the Lord has for new foundation, but you've got two great leaders. I know that. And I know that you've got a great facility. And I know that there are a lot of lost people in this town. But it's not just up to the pastor and his lovely wife. It's up to you as well. We all have a responsibility to walk not with the crowd. Because there's a lot of people in the world that are walking with this group, and they're walking with this group, and they're walking with this group, and nobody's walking with Jesus. You're going to have to walk a road that nobody else will walk, and you're going to have to go to places that nobody else will go. That is the Christian life. And I love it that we have this example. So Jesus goes where nobody else will go. He encounters this woman at the hottest part of the day, and she's all by herself. Jesus knows it's a great opportunity. He knew it before he went there. Verse 7, a woman from Samaria, she came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone into the town to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, would ever ask me, a woman from Samaria, for something to drink? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, if you just knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? So here's the, the part about religion that I want you to stay away from. Don't ever become religious because religion brings about death. This woman tries to impress Jesus with a little bit of religion that she knows. Jacob's well and, 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 the, and the book of Moses. I know a little bit about religion. And she says, are you greater than my religion? And when I hear people tell me what church they go to, they always spout off denominations before they talk about Jesus. They can tell me what they're going to wear. And they can tell me what address they're going to. And they might even be able to tell me the worship set. But they can't tell me how to lead somebody into a relationship with Christ. Yeah. This living water is so amazing. The woman said, you have nothing to draw with. And, and who do you get this living water from? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, I love this, whoever drinks this water here will be thirsty again. But the water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So today in our world, there's two different fountains that you can drink from. It's the fountain of the world or it's the fountain of the gospel. Don't you love it that having a relationship with Christ, though it may be difficult, it's not hard to understand? You either belong to him or you don't. And if you belong to him, you need to live for him. And if you don't live for him, maybe you don't belong to him and you thought you did. Right? And so... I, one of the songs I'm, I just got through writing, and it's an interesting song. I'm, I'm doing songs that are kind of outside the box. I always send these songs to my wife after I'm done in the studio uh, because I want her approval before I put them on the market. And one of the songs I wrote was called A Memory of You. It's an R&B song. And I wrote it after I had a dream one night. And the dream was a Christian man who had just had a child, him and his wife, and he had been at home cleaning the diapers, Losing sleep all night long, loving his wife and his child. And his wife said, you need to go out with your friends. Because you are tired and you're getting kind of irritable. Go have fun and I'll stay here with the baby tonight. I'm dreaming this. And so he decides to go out with his friends, but his friends aren't saved that he is. And they end up at a house party. 
at about 11 o'clock at night. About 200 people, 100 people outside, 100 people inside, DJ on the inside spinning that record doing his thing. And this guy notices a girl on the outside seductively looking at him. And she lures him in to watch her dance on the dance floor. And then I wake up. And that song title came to me, A Memory of You. And so the first verse that my wife listened to when she called me and said, are you doing okay? We need to talk. <laughs> it's been quite a night. I can see your face by a starlit sky. The smell of Chanel is driving me wild. I know it's late, but I think I'm going to stay for a while. That's where a brother gets in trouble, by the way. But you know it's time to go home. You need to go home. <laughs> On the dance floor, you shine. So he, she's already lured him inside, and he's watching her dance. Every move you make illuminates my mind. DJ, play that Marvin Gaye one more time. Because I'm going to keep it real. I'm about to cross that line. And then the chorus. I could call you on the phone, and we could talk all night long. I could make love to you, and there would be more to come. But now I have to choose, and I've got way too much to lose. So I'll walk away with just a memory of you. And so those are the things that God is putting in me. The struggle is real, but God's power is greater. <laughs> being a Christian is the most difficult thing that you will ever go through, but being a Christian is the most rewarding thing that you will ever experience because you'll see that God loves you enough to help you overcome the struggle. Amen. So when I sent that song to my wife, my wife said, no, 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 we're not going to release that one yet. We're going to find out where you are, what's going on. Who is this woman on the dance floor? And when did you know what Chanel is? I said, I had to Google it. I just know it's expensive stuff, so I put it in the song. She said, okay, you can release it. But I love the fact that living water is greater than anything else in the world. And so when Jesus went to a place that nobody else would go to, and he talked to a woman that nobody else would talk to, She's like, look, I can get you some water. And he's like, no, no, no. I'm here to give you water that's greater than that. I'm here to give you something living and alive. And you can only get that through me. And I try to tell people all the time because I meet a lot of young Christians, especially my three boys I'm dealing with this all the time. They think it's more cool to be in the world than to be with Jesus. And I'm trying to share with them that you can't out-cool Jesus at all. There is nothing more amazing than having a relationship with Christ. I know because, I mean, listen, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I wore my favorite shirt yesterday. My wife hates it when I wear it. It says, the devil is a pimp, don't be his hoe. I wear that shirt everywhere. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care what anybody thinks about me because I know what I've got in me is greater than what they got. And I'm able to experience Spirit-filled transformational moments because I know that what God has done in me is greater than what God has done in someone who's lost. So I'm not ashamed of it. I wore, I wore that shirt to, to, to Magic Kingdom Disney World on LGBT that day. So you know I try to keep it real wherever I go. One of my favorite stories that I love to tell, uh, one of my best friends, Marcus Dilly sang a song uh, in 2001 that made it top of the charts. He was in a band, and they were on Soul Train. How many of you remember Soul Train show? He was on Soul Train. He was on Jenny Jones, I think Oprah. I mean, he had this tour. Uh, Rodney Jerkins, I think the guy that did Michael Jackson's album, did his first album. I mean, this guy was on his way. He got addicted to different drugs and different lifestyle changes, and he just realized he was losing his soul in the industry, so he gave it all up, and now he's a worship leader at Steel Creek Church of Charlotte. He's one of the worship leaders there. He's an amazing individual, but he's got a voice. He sings just like Brian McKnight. I mean, unbelievable. He calls me, and I knew that he was having some struggles in his life. This was years ago. He called me at about 11 o'clock at night. He said, man, let's go to Wild Wings Bar and Grill tonight at Ayersley on the south side of town. I said, man, it's 11 o'clock at night. I'm married. And at this time, Marcus was not married yet. He said, man, just ask your wife if, if you can go with me because it's karaoke night, and I want to feel the energy of the crowd. And, and I need a brother to look after me to make sure I go home when I'm done. And I told my wife, and my wife said, well, there ain't nothing good for a man in Charlotte past midnight, so you better have yourself here at 1155. <laughs> I said, yes, ma'am. So I told Marcus to meet me at the front door. And I had actually been there on different times on a date with my wife, so I had witnessed to a lot of people in there. 
the manager and, and the bartender and the guy that bounces at the front door who used to be an NFL player, big dude. So when he saw me coming at like 11.15, because I live right down the road from there, he looked at me and he looked at the watch. He said, yo, pastor, what you doing here, baby? He said, it's 11.15 at night. Did your wife let you out of the house to play? I said, well, I'm going to listen to my boy sing, and I'm going to eat some wings and drink some sweet tea, and then I'm going to go back home to my bride. He said, I ain't going to put no bracelet on you because I know you ain't drinking it up, dog. He said, go have some fun, player. I took a little duck. And I kept... I gave him this big old side saddle hug as much as I could get my arm around him. I went and sat down and got my food. Marcus gets up and it's packed. I'm looking around. There's like 250 people at Wild Wings. It is wall to wall people. I literally looked outside on the deck and I could see people rolling up weed. People drunk, uh, just uh, the provocative nature. It was almost like a little miniature Sodom and Gomorrah taking place at 1130 at night on the south side of Charlotte. And Marcus puts his name in to sing this song. And he sings a song by Brian McKnight called One Last Cry. Good gracious alive. He got up there and started singing, My Shattered Dreams. I mean, he was throwing it. Damn. All the sisters were on the front row with their phones out. Look at this white boy sing. And they're all filming him on the front row. He got a hand clap, and I'm like, that's my boy. I was so proud. He came and sat down. He said, Christian, he said, man, we need to have church up in here. I said, all right, man, how are we going to do that? He said, you know, when you used to travel and do all them youth conferences, you used to do Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre rap songs, and you used to put Christian lyrics over it. He said, won't you break a little Snoop Dogg in here? I'm like, no. <laughs> I said, no, man. I said, you didn't sing no hymnal. Did you want me to get killed? He's like, come on, baby. He said, we can have church up in here. He said, Peter walked on water. I was like, so you're going to get my back if I get up and rap Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre in here? He said, man, I got your back. I said, you got my back. He said, I got your back. I said, all right. So I called my wife. I said, baby, I need a little time extension. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm about to rap Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre in front of about 250 high drunk people. <laughs> and I could hear her say, don't do it as I hang up. I get up to the karaoke guy, and this is what he said. You've been expecting him to say that. He said, what you doing, big country? A little Tim will grow. I said, no, nah, I'm going to do Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, nothing but a G thing. He was like, are you drunk? I said, I'm drunk on the Holy Spirit. He said, you drunk on what? I said, I'm drunk on the Holy Spirit. He said, well, why are you rapping them lyrics, man? Them are terrible lyrics. I said, no, no, no. Don't put the lyrics on the screen. I'm going to rap about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He put his arm around me. He said, man, I don't know if I'd do that either. He said, I've seen a lot of crazy stuff go down, and if you start trying to have church up in here, he said it could turn back. I said, it's all good, man. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I said, but if God decides not to show up, right there's the exit door, you can follow me out. I'll be sprinting that way. So I get up to the microphone. I said, my name is Christian Chapman, and I'm going to rap Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre, nothing but a G thing. And the crowd went crazy. And this guy on the front row with a shot glass and a Budweiser stumbled up to the stage. He said, I hear you, big boy. Bring your game, Snoop Doggy Dog. <laughs> and I said, this is my game. This is, this is Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre. High on Jesus Christ, not West Coast Reefer. And you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> Everybody quit drinking. Everybody quit rolling weed. The bartender was shot. The bouncer was looking at me like, yo, dog, what you doing? <laughs> Silence. And the beat kicked in. It was too late. I went straight into my Snoop Dogg voice. I said, one, two, three, and two, that's four. <laughs> Snoop Doggy Dogg and Dr. Dre is out there joke. I'm ready to make an entrance to step on up. Because of what I tell you makes you want to jump. Give me the microphone first so I can burst like the bubble. Count them long beats together, now the devil's in trouble. Yeah. Ain't nothing but a sea thing, baby. One pumped up Christian, I'm not crazy. The Bible is the label that pays me. I'm unchangeable, so please don't try to change me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I finally got the organ over there. All right. All right. They're playing the organ in here, Pastor. <laughs> and nobody moved for the first two verses. Marcus was hiding behind the booth. <laughs> And I was terrified. But by the third verse, falling back in that slump, are you going that way again? Is the devil on your back? Well, I know just what you need. The capital J E S U M I G H T. Holy Spirit, Jesus, God, you know the Trinity. Yeah. And people started dancing. 
People started shouting. The bartender was ringing the dollar draft bell. The dude with the Budweiser and the shot glass left his liquor and was running back and forth in front of the stage going, I love Jesus! I love Jesus! I mean, this alcoholic is preaching to everybody else. You bunch of drunks need to listen to what this man is rapping about. I mean, I couldn't believe what was taking place. And when the song was over, an eruption happened that I've never experienced in my life. And I've been on stages where there were 30,000 people that I was preaching the gospel to. And the bartender was just going crazy, not serving alcohol. And the karaoke guy came up to me and said, bro, what just happened? <laughs> he said, I do karaoke bars all over this town and I ain't never experienced anything like that. I said, bro, I can explain it to you simply. I said, have you ever been to church? He said, I used to go to church. I said, well, let me explain to you what's taking place. All these beautiful people in here were created in the image of God. But they don't know God. And their inner soul that desires nothing more than to know Jesus, when they experienced living water, they cried out and said, I want what he had. And so when I walked off the stage, there was a line of people, about 30 people long, that was waiting to meet me and Marcus and shake hands with us pray for them, ask what church we worship at so they can come visit. And one of those people was the manager of Wild Wings Bar and Grill that I led to the Lord that night. And I don't know if Angelo and Tyrone remember, we baptized him in Steel Creek Church of Charlotte. And when he came up out of the water, he said, give me my little baby girl. I want to dedicate her to the Lord right now. So check this out. Right after he gives his life to Christ, Wild Wings Bar and Grill makes him the manager of all the Wild Wing Bar and Grills up and down the East Coast. He called me to tell me, and I said, brother, that is proof positive that when you live your life for the Lord, he extends your territory. Yeah. And so because of what Jesus was doing in this moment, he was trying to teach his disciples. It's not just about your route around Samaria. It's about Samaria, Judea, Galilee. It's about the whole world. And that's how tasty living water is. But you can't have good taste if you only come to church one day a week. And that's the extent of your taste. You know, one of the things that I lost during my time of COVID was my smell and my taste. There ain't nothing worse in the world than drinking sweet tea and eating a pepperoni pizza and you can't taste nothing. And boy, I remember the first time I drank sweet tea and that sugar hit my tongue and I went. <laughs> I had a church service in my kitchen floor. And I want you to know that when people experience the taste of Jesus in you, it brings them into life in a way that's much greater than just sweet tea to the top. That's why Jesus said in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, that you can't lose your salt because if you lose it, what good is your taste? You know? I used to have high blood pressure, and then I became vegan and started working out all the time. I lost about 30, 40 pounds and, and had a lot of life transformational change. But boy, I remember my favorite restaurant in town was Lawan Soul Food. And every time I went in there, the owner of that place, she said, here come my little wife, sugar. come in here, baby. I got some cornbread for you. <laughs> and every time I drive by that place, it hurts my soul. <laughs> but I'm honoring God with the damn lifestyle. Yes. But there's nothing better than good taste. How many of you can appreciate that? Yeah. And I'm telling you, as much as you take pride and good taste with what you put into your temple that God gave you to live in, you need to take even greater pride with the spirit of God that lives in you. You need to protect it. You need to feed it. You need to study it. And you need to release it. And the church today is full of people that I'm completely convinced that Paul would say, why are you still on milk? You should be chewing on solid food. And it all comes down to good taste. It all comes down to drinking out of the well that Jesus has for you. I look at you, and I see so much unbelievable beauty and potential in this place. I look at your pastor and his lovely wife, Dr. Rico, and I see so much beautiful teaching and ability and spirit-filled anointing in their life. The sky is the limit for new foundation. And I'm here to encourage that. I'm here to challenge that. Because you see, when an evangelist like me looks around and sees empty chairs, 
He doesn't see an empty chair. He sees an empty soul. So who will you bring to church next Sunday? That's really what it comes down to. Who are you going to share the gospel with tomorrow? Who are you going to encourage to be a part of the gospel lifestyle on Tuesday? Who are you going to pray for on Wednesday? Who are you just going to call and give an encouraging word to on Thursday? Who are you going to go visit that's going through a tough time on Friday? Who are you going to spend time with and share the gospel with on Saturday? Now, Sunday's good, but Monday through Saturday, in my opinion, is even better. There's a lot more time for the gospel. So, as we close out, this beautiful woman receives this living water. I love what she says. She's like, after Jesus says all this, she says, give me a drink. How many of you would love it to be that easy? Share the gospel, live the gospel, and then somebody looks at you and says, I want that. Can I have that? And so this woman asked for it. Now, this is where it gets interesting. This is where it gets real interesting, folks. Because Jesus has known this woman for five minutes. I want you to listen to me. Yeah. Jesus has known this woman for five minutes. She is just now getting comfortable with him in this conversation. And what does Jesus do? Go get your man. I ain't got a man. Jesus said, no, you have five of them. You need to stop. <laughs> now, that don't preach in churches today. Honestly, especially a lot of mega churches. He requires repentance from her life because there is no other way to be saved except on your faith. You cannot have a relationship with Jesus Christ unless you repent. And all these good-looking pastors with them funky hairstyles, man, I dig it. They got thousands of people coming, but you will not hear them talk about hell. You will not hear them talk about God's wrath. You will not hear them talk about salvation through repentance alone. Jesus said you cannot be saved unless you repent. Peter told the 3,000, you need to repent to be saved. There is no coming to Christ unless you know how far away from him you are. And people are always preaching today about how awesome you are to God. We ain't awesome to God. We are filth in His sight. Only made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, King David brought down a giant. He danced half naked. I'm glad I didn't see that, but go ahead, brother, do your thing. I preached on that one time, and this elderly woman said, He did not dance naked. He had an afad on. I said, sweetheart, an afad went from the neck to the belly button. She said, oh, good Lord. <laughs> He did his thing, let him do his thing. I mean, he was, he was dancing and shouting and praising, okay. He did many incredible things, but the greatest moment that King David had was Psalms 51. Let me just tell you. Psalms 51 is the greatest moment that King David ever had. Because he sinned with Bathsheba, and he killed and murdered her husband. I tell people all the time when they come to me, and go, man, I can't go to church, the roof is going to fall in. I'm like, man, you slept with somebody else's wife? Yeah, I've done that before. Did you kill her husband? No, I was like, well, you welcome to church. <laughs> King David, one of the greatest kings ever, and he did that. He's like, he did? Like, yeah, Moses had a temper, Noah got drunk, passed out of neck. I, mean, I could go on and on. It's amazing how God can transform whoever you are and whatever you're dealing with, God's got an answer for it. Amen. King David is held accountable by the prophet, and he doesn't come to him and go, King David, you were so awesome. You slayed that giant, and you've done so many incredible things, and you're the greatest king that God has ever anointed. He came to him and said, you're a sinner. You need to stop. And boy, King David writes one of the most beautiful psalms in the world. Psalms 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfading love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from all my sin. For I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I was sinful from the days my mother conceived me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is wrong in your sight. So that you, O oh Lord, are proved right when you justify judging me. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from all of my sin. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. 
Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me and my lips will sing of your righteousness. Open my tongue and my mouth will give praise to your name. For you do not delight in sacrifices or I would bring them. You do not delight in burnt offerings or they would be here at your altar. King David said, what you delight in, O Lord, is a broken spirit. A broken heart, O God, you will never despise. Then there will be whole burnt offerings to lay at your feet and rams to put at your altar and Zion will prosper. But it starts with brokenness and repentance. The rich young ruler, every time I read that story, I cry because he could have been one of the great ones, but he wouldn't repent and walk away from his sin. So I want to be very vulnerable. I don't want to be very honest with you. Can I be honest with you this morning? I haven't even told this to the beautiful people that followed me and, and was a big part of my leadership at church. In the midst of being a pastor, somewhere along the line, I started drinking. Socially. One beer on the golf course led to two. Led to three. The three beers on the golf course led me going out with my wife and having a margarita. And I had so much fun having a margarita, I had two. Having that margarita at the Mexican restaurant led to me bringing home liquor and putting it in my house, in my man cave, my Clemson man cave. And I kind of jokingly say, even though I don't drink anymore, there's a time to drink, it's now watching Clemson University play football. <laughs> it's a bad time right now. But it consumed me. I didn't get drunk. But I had to have it every day of my life. I had replaced my love for God and my relationship with Him with something of the world. And God told me when COVID started, and I tell people all the time, I, I, I get a little weary when people come up to me and say, oh, 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 God told me this and God told me that. If you're going to say God say anything, you better be right because you're speaking for the God of the universe. So very rarely I ever tell anybody God said anything, but I heard God tell me when this began. I got you. I got you covered during this. You're going to be fine. And my boys got sick, and I didn't get sick, and everybody was getting sick around me, and I didn't get sick. And I felt pretty good about it, but in the midst of that, I was living for the world while I was preaching the gospel. When I got sick, I got over it in about four days. When my wife was about to die, I heard the Lord speak to me. He said, have I got your attention yet? I threw away every liquor bottle in my house. I haven't taken a sip in two months, and I will never, ever take a sip of alcohol again. Not that it's wrong. I didn't take you to Scripture where the Lord told them to take the offering and go buy hard liquor and celebrate. So you do with that what you want to. I'm just telling you, Jesus drank Luke chapter 7. I can go on and on. The wedding miracle, right? He brought the best that was last. I had somebody try to convince me one time that he wasn't talking about real alcohol. It was watered down. I'm like, wait a minute. In Isaiah chapter 1, God punished him and said, I'm watering down your best wine. The wedding master said, you brought your best wine. And he brought enough to kill an elephant. <laughs> There's like 140 gallons after it was all gone. So I can, I'm not being legalistic about this. I'm just telling you that I had another love than Jesus. And Jesus said, have I got your attention yet? I lifted the covering off your life so that you know that if you're going to serve me and if you're going to live for me and if you're going to preach me, you're going to be an example for me. I got to be honest. I haven't shared that with anyone. And I don't know when God's going to release me back to ministry again. If he's done with me here behind this pulpit, that's okay. That's only consumed an hour and a half of my time. He's not done with me outside these doors. And I say that to say this. Because in this beautiful story, when this woman repents of her sin, it says in Scripture that she left her water jar behind. Which means what she came in the flesh to receive, she left because what she had in the Spirit was great. And it said that she witnessed to all the Samaritan men that were trying to kill her because they stoned you to death for her lifestyle. She went and many of those men got saved because of this woman's bold, passionate, radical testimony. 
I love her. I love you. I want you to know, I got saved in 1987 after I drug overdosed in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. My dad came and got me, brought me back. How many of you know Freedom Job, Charlotte? I raced motocross for Charlotte Honda on Freedom Job. Didn't have an education. My parents went through a nasty divorce, and I went from being a ranked athlete to being nothing. Not a lot of hope. I went back to get my GED. I was working at the shop and racing on Sunday, so I didn't go to church. And I went to a party in 1987, and I had a line of cocaine up to my nose, and I handed the mirror back to the guy. I said, man, I'm just going to go home tonight. And I jumped on my street bike, and I started heading back to Kannapolis, North Carolina, where I was born and raised. And I ran out of gas at Harris Boulevard at 3 o'clock in the morning, took my helmet off, thumb for a ride, a taxi cab picked me up, went and got gas, put gas in the bike, said bye to the taxi cab, and he drove off with my keys to my bike in his car. So it's about 3.45 in the morning, 4 o'clock in the morning, and I had an encounter with God. I was raised in church, a small pilgrim holiness Wesleyan church. My grandma played the organ, my aunt played the piano, my grandpa and dad sang in the choir. Went to church every Sunday. I thought I was a Christian, but I was as unsaved as anybody you've ever met. And I cried out to God for the first time in my life, and I prayed, and I was weeping at 4 o'clock in the morning at Harris Boulevard on the side of the road with a broke-down bike. And I cried out to God, and it was the most simple, uneducated prayer you've ever heard. I am lost. I don't believe in you. I don't feel you. I don't see you. I don't, I don't believe that you even exist. But I've always been told that you love me. And I've never been in a place where I needed to be loved more. So if you would just let me know tonight that you love me, I will give my life to you and I'll never look back. And when I prayed that prayer, I opened my eyes. And a navy blue Pontiac Firebird had already pulled over while I was praying. I wasn't even thumbing for a ride. I walked up to the window. He rolled down the window. I looked inside. And when he turned on the inside light to the car, I saw a Bible sitting on the passenger side seat. And I looked down, and in 1987, it was a black man that picked a white kid up. He had an earth, wind, and fire afro, and I had the ugliest mullet you've ever seen in your life. Three earrings and tattoos. Some I had to get lasered off. So my wife said, I don't know who Angie is, but my name's Amy. That's coming off your arm. I said, I don't even know who Angie was either. But that's how I live, without Christ. And that man looked into my eyes at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I'll never forget his words. I've never seen him since, but I'm going to get to worship with him forever in heaven. He said, son, I don't know what led you to this place, but I want you to get in the car. Because the Holy Spirit filled my car up when I was about to pass you and said, pick this young man up and tell him how much I love him. i got a plan for his life. So I got saved in 1987, which is why diversity is a huge part of my life. That's why I adopted three biracial children. Because in 1987, a black man picked a white kid up not because he saw me as white. And I didn't get saved because I saw him as black. He saw the message of love. And I received it for what it was. And it transformed my life. And I've been changed ever since. Do I make mistakes? I'm not the best father in the world. I'm not the best husband. I've been married 33, 34 years. I'm not the best husband in the world. If I was a great husband, I'd know if it was 33 or 34. I'm glad my wife's not here. I'm not a great neighbor all the time. And these folks right here that come to, used to come to my church, they'll tell you. Whew. Well, Pastor Christian used to run them out sometimes. But I'm here doing this because I've been washed as white as snow. Because I am radically in love with Jesus. Because I repent of my sins and I know that he is greater. Because I believe in this book for my life, and I'm going to live it until the day I die. I chased so many women when I was growing up. Two weeks after I got saved, I met my wife on a blind date. God said, I've been waiting on you to come to me. I got the greatest treasure you'll ever receive right here. I want to challenge you today as we pray. I don't know how we're going to end. You guys going to do a song? Well, whatever you want to do. I would actually love to hear y'all sing again, to be honest with you. I know we've been in here a while. I tell people all the time, Jesus was on the cross for six hours. We shouldn't cry about two hours, right? But I would encourage anybody here. I just want to do something that I feel like the Lord asked me to do today. 
If you have a struggle in your life, just like the struggle of, the, of alcohol that I was dealing with, if you have a struggle in your life that you would like to come to the altar and pray, and just let me pray with you, then I would encourage you to do that. If you've never given your life to Christ, and you really be, believe that you've been drinking out of the wrong fountain for a long time, but today you want to drink out of the living water fountain of Jesus Christ, I want you to come down here and I want to pray with you. If you would like to just repent, start there. I got some things that I've been holding on. God, today I'm going to give it to you. Can we have some time at the altar? But let me tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take the same thing that I just gave you, me humbling myself enough to say, this was a struggle in my life, but God is greater. It's going to ask and require of you to humble yourself as well. So who would be the first one? It always takes... It always takes one. Let's come down and let's just kneel together. Or you don't even have to kneel. You can stand. The Lord takes you just as you are. Anybody else? And don't come just because other people are. I just always, that first one that always comes normally opens up a, a tide of people. There you go. Amen. Oh, you. Yeah.